Hello and welcome to this new edition of the Paranormal Concept Show on the PAUK Network. I'm your host Paul Rook and tonight or today um, we are joined as always by the lovely Kerry Greenaway. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. And we are also joined in the studio by Richard Clements. Hello, Richard. Hi there, guys. Can I go out now? No. No, No, afraid not. No, (laughs) not not for another three weeks. Just about another three weeks and then then maybe. (laughs) I'm doubtful, but maybe. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I'm I'm doing all right this end. Yeah, just ticking along, ticking along. Good, good, good. It does yeah, feel so like that, doesn't it? Just I, I wouldn't all, I wouldn't normally ask what you've been up to, but I think the answer's going to be the same as last time, isn't it? Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just listen to the start of last week's show, and you'll yeah, probably get it. the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> okay, so because obviously we can't, we can't do the normal um, what we've been up to, so let's just crack on with the show and get on with it. Yeah, why not? Yeah, so what what are we talking about this week then? Well, what the, last, we the last few weeks we've been talking about um, the concept of marketing and media hype and, you know, um, how a urban legend or a ghost story can get taken and embellished and brought forward. And yeah, then, you know, that's, that's sort of basically what, you know, the area we've sort of like talked about in the last couple of weeks. So I thought... We do get hauntings. There are hauntings that are out there. You know, it, it, the ghost story, there's no smoke without fire, as one of my old friends used to say. And uh, they are a thing. You know, people do have well, experiences, don't they? They, they do I mean, have yeah, things. It's, it's alleged paranormal activity. You know, we can't say they're hauntings because we don't actually know what... A ha- well, a, no. what what the, the ghost is supposed to be. You know, there could be a logical explanation. We just haven't found it yet. No, this is true. Exactly. And and a lot of it could just be, you know, pareidolia. It could be how your eye is, you know, looking at things in the dark. You know, all sorts of reasons why. We don't know. But activity has been reported time and time again um, in many different forms. So we thought we'd actually break it down and actually put some good old human boxes on things. <laughs> Of course. Okay, yeah. Love and, a box, right? Got to gotta love it. a box. That's it, into boxes, label them and file them for another day. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we thought okay. we'd, we'd have a look at the different types of hauntings is what we're going to have a little look at today. Very, you know, whistle-stop tour before we delve a bit deeper into some of these in other shows. But uh, we're going to yep. give you a whistle-stop tour about some of the, the boxes of what uh, paranormal activity could be classed as, I suppose. Yes, I mean, and they do seem to have been put into sort of categories and over the years. So, yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so I've pulled out this first box we can go through. Oh, God, yeah. Which one? <laughs> which one? Box? What's in the box? It, well, it's labelled poltergeist, so I'm assuming it's poltergeist stuff that's in it. But it keeps moving about. And making oh, noises. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a lively box, this one. Um, and a lot of hauntings could be classed as poltergeist because it does actually mean noisy ghost, right? Absolutely. Well, yeah, that's the general consensus. Yeah. Yes, a German word, I believe. Mm-hmm. Now, the most famous one, I think we all know, um, is the Enfield haunting. Yes. You do surprise me. I know. We love the bit of the Enfield haunting. Now, we all know the story of like a single parent, Peggy Hodgson, called the police to a rented home in Enfield, the Enfield haunting, it's otherwise known as. Um, absolutely fascinating case study. Now, this is probably the def- definitive poltergeist study case um, from the SPR, right? Society of Paranormal yeah, Research. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, in regards to from very early in the case to pretty much the end of the case. Mm-hmm. And if you've not read the book by Guy Lee on Playfair, I suggest you do because that gives you a complete understanding of what they did, what they didn't do. There's lots of the kids faked it, or didn't they fake it? You know, lots of stuff, that, a lot of controversy around this case. But it was... See, not only, not only was it a book, but it's also in a film, isn't it? Oh, Wasn't it the Country 2 and yeah. countless other versions of it as well? Yeah, 
Yeah, there was a mini series actually, a three parter, I believe it was a mini series, okay. um, which kind of was closest to the events. Um, there was mm -hmm. still a little bit of artistic license in there, but it was a pretty good version, I suppose you would call yeah. it. But if you do want the definitive understanding, then definitely um, check out Guy's book himself because obviously he was the one that was very involved in the case um, mm -hmm. to really get to grips with all the ins and outs of, of the case. And I do believe, and I can't remember who wrote it, um, but all the tapings they did, all the, you know, they taped everything um, when they were there. There was lots of stuff that was irrelevant, like normal conversations, but they caught a lot of the activity on tape. And a lot of that tape has now been transcribed, and that's actually a book out there, but I can't remember the name, and I can't remember the author. Should have checked that out, really. But <laughs> I know it's yeah, that, just been released. Yeah, it's actually um, and just been released. I think it's under the guise of the SPR, but don't take my word on that, but... Yeah. One thing I would like to do is get my grubby little mitts on the archives of, the, mm. of this case. Yes, uh, that would be quite a uh, quite a uh, afternoon spent, I should imagine, and going through those. Just an afternoon, Richard. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> now it hit the media, and that's really where everybody first heard about this case was when a newspaper reporter went in and actually witnessed activity for himself. Police witnessed activity and couldn't explain it. They saw a chair moving across the floor. And uh, that's sort of how the SPR found out about it and ended up being involved in it. Um, all sorts of activity took place on this one, from, you know, levitations, things moving in the house, um, even mini fires like matches, matchbox would go on fire, not massive fires. We'll talk about that bit in a minute with something mm -hmm. else. Um, there was, oh, gosh going through walls, airports, strange voices, knockings, all sorts of activity um, was down to this um, alleged ghost. You know, um, very, very interesting case if you don't know about this. And we're not going to go into... I've just, I've just found information about that book. Um, ah. It's called The Enfield Poltergeist Tapes, One of the Most Disturbing Cases in History and What Really Happened mm. by Dr. Melvin J. Willing. Yes. Definitely go check that out. That's the one. It is on Amazon and various other bookshops online. Yeah, he transcribed the tape. Mm. He went through hours yeah. and hours of tapes um, to transcribe. Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But this is like the typical poltergeist activity, what you would expect. But I would say this is high-end. Yeah. Well, totally. well, certainly, I mean, it is what you speak to anyone about poltergeist and activity and this, and this one will be possibly at the top of everyone's list i mean it's been it's been well documented and as you say the books and uh, it's even been um, portrayed in uh, sort of films and and television so yeah the, the the poltergeist haunting i should imagine a lot of people would actually know about mm. it is definitely one of these go-to cases and when people do say um poltergeist cases that is normally amongst the top two that people can come out with. Oh, definitely. I mean, Guy Leon Playfair himself was actually quite an authority in regards to investigating poltergeist phenomena in his own right. He had done a lot of work over in um, South America pre prior to this case. So when he got called in, um, well, when he offered his help to Maurice Gross, who actually was the one who took on the case originally, mm. Um, and yeah. then Guy came in later. Um, the understanding is poltergeist generally starts and stops quite quickly. It generally <laughs> always occurs at night or in the presence of a certain person. A lot of people have said young children, haven't they? Yes, yeah, I mean... Yeah. It does tend to be young women, doesn't it? Like in teens. Yeah, sort of girls going through uh, uh, puberty and... Uh, it does seem to be a common thread and throughout most sort of poltergeist hauntings, and it's certainly something investigators will sort of look for first if uh, this sorts of uh, activity are are reported. Well, well, the work I've looked at with um, poltergeist, it just seemed to have that factor, but 
it does also sort of have it's not predominantly female there is always a male involved as well so it it tends to need that balance of masculine and feminine Mm -hmm. and it's not always young children sometimes it's the older ladies of a certain age as well so it it does seem to be that transitional stage of um the female point but there will always be a male involved as well as in not necessarily in a sexual way i'm not talking about a relationship i'm talking about in the environment you know like so like for example in this farm um they had janet margaret johnny and billy Mm -hmm. was involved in that case um in that house and the mother was of a certain age as well when you look at 30 east drive you had um the boy and the girl Philip and can't remember her name. Anyway, no. there was a boy and a girl in there um, as yeah. well. And actually, when you start reading out other cases, older cases, um, they do tend to be uh, the, there's tends to, tends to be um, that factor. Now, what's sort of put, been put forward is that it's like an uncontrolled psychokinesis. So basically, like. The people are creating it or putting yeah. out the energy for something else to use to create it because there's still that we don't know. We don't know if it's them creating it or whether or not, as Guy Leon Playfair says, it's like you put out a ball of energy and then your local elemental or sprite or whatever comes along and goes, oh, nice big ball of energy. I'm going to play <laughs> with that. And then it stops just as quickly as it starts. So, it does need that agent or a focus. It definitely needs that, yeah? But whether or not it is that person creating it or whether or not it is a spirit that's using that energy that's being expended, we don't know. No, yeah. it's a very sort of difficult one to sort of like come to, but it seems to make sense. I mean, you look at the type of activity, which can be quite uh, dramatic, and it does, and it, it's quite easy to associate it with an external with the end result of an internal process being made external, you know, frustration, anger, or sort of, you know, those sort of things uh, people do experience, especially going through these particular age age ranges we're talking about, uh, children and uh, women of a certain age. Yeah. Mm. It is interesting that it it happens at that time. And emotionally, you are less likely to be able to control your emotions so yes. if you're trying to suppress the strength of that emotion, that energy has to go somewhere. So it does seem to be in these transitional phases of life. And boys, you do get puberty as well, which is why you can't discount the male side of it. It's a very Absolutely. interesting jump I mean, to... There, there are cases as well just involving boys. I do believe that, um, I think, wasn't it the 30 East Drive case? Um, back in the 60s, it was centred around the grandmother and the young boy she was babysitting. It started off, the very first encounter with that particular entity um, was the grandmother and the son, Philip. Not exactly. The girl was, there was And gone. it was the boy that was in that stage of puberty. Yeah, but yeah. The, the activity also happened when none of the children were, 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 were there exactly. either. But that case is very controversial in its own right because it wasn't researched in the way it should be it's basically a local historian that had written it down there's a couple of uh, newspaper articles and when i was looking into that it got very sketchy she was saying it sounds very media sensationalized and even some of the interviews with the people involved it sounds like do you remember when rather than (laughs) it being documented properly so it, it is a very difficult one to pin down that case well, um, I mean, just using that as an example, yeah. as a face value sort of thing at the moment. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good... Well, uh, it, it's still one that we all know, and, and a huge paranormal investigation industry has built up around that case, you know, which we haven't yeah. got um, the chance to do. With then feel one thing that is curious to me with, with these cases, people go, I'd love to go and investigate in the Enfield Haunting House, um, which you can't do. I would just like to put that out there. It's, it's You can't do that. Um, no. but it's not open for investigation. The family lives there and have had no more trouble since um, back when it happened. And But 30 East Drive, you can. 
Now, people do report of having a very active night or a non-active night, which leads me to the assumption that poltergeist usually come and go very quickly. So if it was there, it's not necess- It's not going to be there now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anything, with poltergeist and activity, uh, you are looking at sort of like a sort of and possibly up to about an 18 months sort of time span. And this does seem to be pretty much the case in an, in a lot of reported cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So if people are getting activity in 30 East Drive now, it kind of makes you wonder if it's somebody's, it's almost like a extended Philip experiment. Your belief in it is creating it rather than it actually being there still. So, you know. I mean, there's definitely still other theories surrounding that you know so yeah there are other theories on that one definitely um but i wanted to bring another case to the table which i'd read about oh gosh quite a few years ago now and this kind of one i wanted to bring this to the table because it's very relevant in today's um media reporting Mm -hmm. and this is about the case of the canetto di caronia fires and i'm not sure if i said that right <laughs> but it's basically it's we've small... got you on italian today <laughs> uh-huh i've got italian i'm not very good with the italian accent though is all i'm saying now this is a small town in sicily over in italy now if you read the newspaper reports on this it's gosh this is a town-wide poltergeist going on you know all sorts of weird stuff happened but the main gist of it is this um spontaneous fires would break out mm-hmm. um, here, there and everywhere um, and they, it, there's a whole conspiracy around this as well, it really is a, a whole bag of, of um, let's throw every part of the paranormal into this um, but it started off basically with these spontaneous fires and um, <laughs> that, a lot of investigation went into this to try to, to resolve this but just to give you an idea of, of how bad it allegedly got and i'm going to use the word allegedly because i'm going to we'll come on to that in a minute right so boats cables beds sofas chairs cookers vacuum cleaners tvs refrigerators washing machines cables spontaneously caught fire glasses imploded aubergines were colored like the rainbow they had um apparently yeah yeah yeah. um unexplained magnetic field peaks detected um oh gosh compasses losing their orientation Car alarms ringing with no reason. I mean, if this this poltergeist really ransacked this whole town. Um, deaths of animals from the ground and the sea. Oh, it just goes on and on and on. There's about 350 different records about cases documented. Now, mm. some of these were actually witnessed, not just by the people in the house, but by uh, the military, journalists, policemen, etc., etc., etc. But I looked into this quite deeply because it seems too good to be true, right? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well, you get something like this and you think, you know, wow. And uh, But sort of being in this sort of, sort of industry type thing, you do learn to sort of think if something sounds too good to be true. Um. It usually is. Yeah. <laughs> now, at the time, it was completely unexplained. They even evacuated the town. Now, bearing in mind, it sounds like, because, oh, they evacuated the whole town. Small town. Yeah. You're not looking at hundreds and hundreds of people here. You're looking at a small amount of people. So when they evacuated the town to have a look... At the time, there was about uh, mm, about forty odd people, so that's how small we're talking. Yeah. Uh, now the local priest um, and the press labelled it a poltergeist. The mm. priest was actually an exorcist. He was, um, you know, he did that. But you've got to look at the beliefs, the general population belief system, highly religious. Highly religious, and particularly in Sicily, which is the island off the bottom of Italy as well, and sort of they and priests and stuff do occupy quite a highly respected uh, person in the community. So it probably they would have gone to him first and uh, taken what he sort of said as the initial sort of explanation for what was going on. Yeah, yeah, particularly when we've got. Because priest said it, so oh, yeah, nice. well, be apologise. Yeah. Particularly when you've got no rational explanations coming out from um, other respected bodies like policemen and military and stuff like that. Mm. You know, what I mean, they did a lot of work in this area to try to work out what it was. But mm. this was back in two thousand and four. Didn't last for a huge amount of time. It only lasted about a year, 
and then it stopped and then they had a resurgence a few years later on this so they you know they, and they couldn't <laughs> couldn't explain it oh ma- <laughs> the mothers uh, woke up oh, uh, the paranormal coach is here <laughs> he's like what <laughs> 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 anyway uh, an update i found out this um was basically a man has actually been arrested for fires causing mysterious fires Giuseppe yes. Pizzino was actually arrested for allegedly starting the blazes. And um, a lot of the, when you really get to the people that actually went and investigated it and you read the reports and that, it is definitely not, you couldn't look at that and go paranormal. The only paranormal twist came from the priest originally and then that was jumped on by the media. And the media yeah. are the one that drove the case to where it ended up being a big paranormal mystery conspiracy. <laughs> also, geologically, where this is, where this town is, it's set near Mount Etna and two other volcanoes. So they're saying it could be a combination of things. So they, you had these guys setting off spontaneous fires, but other things that were grouped as all part of the phenomena could actually be natural phenomena caused by the volcano underground um, kind of goings on. Yeah. Electromagnetic field fluctuations, you know, um, all sorts of things that happen in, in a volcanic area could explain some of the other phenomena. But what has happened um, is they've grouped it all together and made five down to belief system and this is where you have to be very careful and this is the only reason i'm mentioning it under the poltergeist case scenario is because it shows that you have to be very careful jumping to a paranormal assumption when there could be several different logical logical reasons separately it just coincidental i suppose that it all happens around that sort of time Mm. yeah it certainly does because uh sort of like just looking at and at the notes here, I mean, after the initial sort of poltergeist claims and, and the press, they the Italian authorities did actually seem to put a lot of scientific research actually into this, uh, calling a lot of agencies to actually look. So they were obviously sort of like working along the premise that it was a, some sort of environmental problem that was happening. There was something in the environment that was actually causing this. Yeah, but if you actually look at this, I say you'll be shocked at the amount of conspiracy theory. This even brought the ufology world into it. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, government conspiracy of a a pulse, you know, electromagnetic pulse weapon was being tested around that area. And so much, you know, so much crap, basically, was Mm. attributed to some of the activity they had. But when you actually broke it down, add in media hype, I mean, God, a multicoloured rainbow aubergine, really? Mm. Well, yeah. <laughs> Unless I so, actually saw that with my own eyes, I don't believe that. I kind of don't well, believe it. Aubergines do discolour. I know that. I used to not into a rainbow. <laughs> well, perhaps not, but they can discolour. But yeah, but unless you actually saw a picture of it, yeah, you know, the description may be totally different. I mean. You don't know, do you? You don't know. Or it could have been, it wasn't rainbow coloured, it was multicoloured as in yeah. um, different shades of aubergine, I don't know, you know what I mean? And the yeah. press have twisted it. You know, it just, it kind of really gives you that drive of um, how things got grouped together and false reported. Yeah. Mm. And that's one of the things I actually wanted to, um, that's one of the things you actually have to be aware of in regards to reading a newspaper report about activity and the real story behind it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it comes down to uh, due diligence and stuff. And uh, if you read something and just go in your gut feeling and think, well, this does sound a bit too good to be true. And as we said at the start of this sort of like uh, um, an article, I mean, it probably is too good to be true, you know. But then it, you say that maybe the SPR thought that about the Enfield haunting when it first hit their table. But, uh, you know, really, I think the only reason um, they took it seriously because they had actually got um, a named police officer who was actually part of a press release um, uh, video. You, mm-hmm. you know, you can actually there out there to see. Um, 
confirming that she witnessed what she witnessed. Yeah. She can't explain it, which gave it more weight. Whereas yeah. some of the people that have said, allegedly said this, allegedly said that in the fire case, um, it's just a policeman said. You know, there's no name. And particularly if they're convicted an arsonist over the events that happened around that time. I mean, that's a big red herring as well. Yeah, so you do have to be very careful when you are looking at um, some cases that hit the media um, for false reporting. But um, uh, poltergeist haunting is a definite phenomena. It has been deeply researched by lots of different people. In fact, next week we're actually going to be speaking to somebody who's been researching the poltergeist phenomena in a lot more depth and has formed his own opinions of that. That's Mr John Fraser. Um, We're going to be speaking to him about his book that he's written purely about poltergeist so let's leave poltergeist there and let's have a look at intelligent hauntings paul do you want to lead on this one have i got to put this poltergeist box away now yeah you (laughs) need to get out the intelligent haunting box now please okay right okay let's just pull this one out it should have a brain on the top oh yep i found it i've got it Mm -hmm. yep brilliant so we'll we'll take this box out now um, okay, so basically a ha- um, an intelligent haunting would be something, for example, like um, a spirit that you can interact with. Um, you know, like allegedly when people use Ouija boards, they're interacting with an intelligent spirit um, and that sort of thing. Um, so again, something like um, in the story of um, The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Yeah. Again, you know, that, they brought forward these three ghosts and they they again were intelligent hauntings um so yeah that's sort of what we're looking at now so there you go kerry there, there's the basics <laughs> <laughs> that's sorted next basically you're getting a response whether you know we, we paul's named ouija but evp response or um you ask them to do something and they do it you know mm-hmm. that kind of thing anything that is responsive to you and can interact with you as a person is allegedly gives it intelligence. Yeah, see, I, I have I have issues sometimes with these intelligent spirits because sometimes they're not that intelligent. And you know, you're like, can you can you ask for, uh, you know, if your spirit is there, can you like knock on something? And it does the weakest tap you could ever find, you know, you could imagine. <laughs> and it's like, is that, you know, you. Your counterparts and that can move tables and stuff, and all you can do is tickle the sideboard. It's yeah, tickle the sideboard. (laughs) (laughs) Surely there's something more that they could do, you know, especially if they're in places where there's more than one spirit. You know, you could just go, Here, mate, come here, give me a hand. (laughs) (laughs) So many assumptions in that statement alone. It's quite a broad sweep there, isn't it, Terry? <laughs> well, you never know, do you, you know? <laughs> they, the intelligent hauntings tend to stick to um, a particular um, home or place of, you know, living place or area of land or an object, which is slightly different. We'll come on to that in a bit. Um, or a person. They, they, don't, they don't seem to, like, go out. They seem to stick to an area, don't they? intelligent hauntings which if they were intelligent surely they wouldn't it's yeah, kind of like my theory on that one but they I would roam around a bit but yeah but as you say kerry it is very sort of localized i mean uh this is sort of what i should gauge a lot of uh, paranormal investigators actually go out to actually encounter as you know or they try to encounter as opposed to the more benign you know sort of like spirits that repeat themselves or stuff Mm. like that i mean it is the intelligent sort of hauntings that everyone seems to be particularly uh, interested in and try to interact with on investigations yeah i mean are are they localized i really i mean you you could go to somewhere like for example um epping forest and it it was a royal forest at one point and you would have had the kings and queens at the time riding through hunting and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you could go to, say, for example, the Tower of London and pick up the same spirit as what was in Epping Forest. Then they're not, I mean, OK, they're not miles, miles, miles apart, but there's still a good big distance between them. Mm. 
Yeah, we, but we really don't know. But it doesn't seem to be. That's the point, isn't it? That doesn't yeah. seem to be the thing. It, I mean, there is a theory that an intelligent haunting is tied to a place because of a reason. You know, there, yes. there's this theory, isn't there, that it's like a traumatic death or a murder or an accident or, you know, something like emotionally traumatic ties them to a specific place which is why they haunt that particular place but as we discussed in like the gallows show or you know the newgate prison show if it Mm -hmm. was that kind of emotion that tied you to a place then you kind of would think there would be a lot more of that than there seems to be um Mm. you know The other thing with this um, that occurred to me would be we looked into, um, ages ago, we looked into, again, the theory is like the unfinished business thing. So that, you know, because Mm -hmm. of a murder or something like that, or they're there to protect something. And in regards to protection, we couldn't actually find many cases of that. When we actually delved into it, the reasons were ownership. Murder. It was always like the negative emotional set, not the love or the, you know, um, it wasn't something positive. I mean, oh, you know, there's theories, oh, that he's haunted it because he loved it so much. Really? <laughs> that sort of theory, I think, sort of comes from, it, it could possibly come from what we touched upon lo- and, and last week with novels. That's more of a romantic, uh, fictional sort of overlay on top of perhaps something that does actually happen, but they've given it a veneer of the human touch to it, you know. So, you know, the romantic ghost comes back. I mean, you look at some of the classic works in in in, in literature, you know, Wuthering Heights is a classic example, you know, the ghost coming back, you know, of Cathy to uh, search for Heathcliff. I mean, it certainly does have that. So I would imagine that that is more of an overlay on an underlying sort of yeah, uh, I mean, even, ghost phenomena. You even had um, Ghost with Patrick Swayze. You know, that was sort of a lovey-dovey film, wasn't it? Yeah. It is a... It is a but that, like Richard said, it is an overlay. Now, in, in if you look at it both yeah. ways, whether it's like the lovely, you know, romantic kind of overview or it's the bad overview, it's yeah. still a... a reality projection onto that situation because we don't know yeah, and mm-hmm. even most intelligent haunting activity that you seem to get can only manage one or two words and we kind of join dots you know what did you live here knock once for yes twice for no kind of thing oh yep you lived here <laughs> do you know what i mean that could possibly have a rational explanation it could be coincidental that that's come up do you know what i mean at that particular moment in time who knows you know um but this is basically you know a belief system that there are intelligent this is all belief system mm. I, I get that it's all belief system and again it's the mechanisms of if you were intelligent why would you yeah. want that particular place for that reason? And yes, you can look back in history and go, well, there was a murder here, so maybe that's why they're like, maybe it's an unsolved murder, I, I that's think, why you know, they're if, haunting. If, if you do think that, I think there, there's a movie out there called The Others yeah. that will just blow your mind. Yeah, I like that movie. That was a good movie. Yeah, it's a good like, film. Are uh, we the actual ghosts, everybody? Are we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Although what Paul said to me last night about my dreams, I thought, God, if that if we're living when we're awake, we're actually living in a dream, and when we're dreaming, that's the reality. That's one screwed up world, is all I can say. Yes, a weird <laughs> conversation that one was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you haven't, you haven't, proved, you haven't proved it yet. So. But I, but I still think you know, sort of like we assume that the uh, but that I there's something tragic happened or they're coming back to protect someone but i think that comes a lot more from us our sort of thinking and our way to try and rationalize it i mean what and what triggers this could be something totally different we just don't know (laughs) but again we're just talking all on theories and and boxes that humans have put on these types of phenomena you know um one thing i have to say is very rarely even with poltergeist the one um and intelligent one thing comes out very clear is if they were intelligent and they've got this energy to communicate, 
and I say this goes from both both sides, both poltergeist and intelligent. They don't they don't seem to hurt with the capacity that they seem to be able to. They can throw a chair across the room, but it won't very it very rarely hit somebody. Well, yeah, there is sort of classic. Yeah, you know, and again, I've sort of read reports with, with poltergeist uh, activity in particular. If an object moves, you it's very rare if it's all reported, you actually see the object move from situ. You will notice the result of the object being thrown. I mean, that seems to be very common. It will come past you or land by you. You won't actually see the, say, the glass ornament on the mantelpiece actually move from there. You'll be, it seems that you're diverted with doing something and then that will smash on your, just by your feet. Mm. Mm. But it wouldn't actually hit I mean, yeah. you. No, you see uh, that at one of these other famous locations in the UK. Um, I do believe um, they have pennies thrown at them. Oh. But they seem to have come through the wall. Mm-hmm. Cool. Is that Winchester? No, no. It's the one we mentioned earlier, East Drive. Yeah, I've, I've heard sort of pennies and uh, Lego bricks, I think that might have been uh, Enfield and marbles as well. Yeah, which, that uh, seems to be the... I mean, and, and stones as well, occasionally, mm. in certain locations. They, it's like they've this, whoever's there and experiences it claim that they come through the wall. There's no other explanation of where they've come from. Yeah. And no one actually witnesses that happening. They always, no. as Richard said, they're always focused on where it's landed mm. you know and no one's ever witnessed it coming through the wall mm. so I very much doubt that it did well whatever an intelligent haunting could be there is this belief system that it's there to be warn you of danger or help you in some form or give you an idea that they are there and maybe you mm. can help them to move on you know um, so that it, you know intelligent haunting is kind of like um, Richard said it does seem to be what we all want. We all go out, ask questions and, you know, with our voice recorders and hopefully get a response, you know, from Mm. that. Um, And that does tend to be what investigators seem to be after. Now, there's another form um, of haunting, which is just a residual haunting. Now, this is just an imprint, basically. We Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't be able to interact with it. Isn't this a residual haunting, not a residue haunting? Residual. Did I say residual yeah. or residual? Uh, I, I thought you said um, residue. Residual. Mm. Uh, residual. Residual. Are you you're having a go at my black <laughs> pronunciation he's been very, again? He's been very pernickety today, isn't he? <laughs> he is. Maybe he needs a nap. Maybe. <laughs> I would say that he probably needs to go out. But right, yeah. Out. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's getting a little bit like stir crazy over there. <laughs> Whichever way you'd like to say it, this is the one that's imprinted on the environment. And these sorts of warnings <laughs> are tended to be sort of like associated with the traumatic event, aren't they? I mean, uh, that people actually sort of believe that can imprint themselves on the immediate environment around where these events uh, actually occur yeah but it's like a cycle it's like um, yeah. people witness the same thing in the same place at the not necessarily the same time but the same type of event happens each time the same appearance you know the yeah. white lady comes under this you know oh i saw a white lady on the the parapet or whatever you know um or walking across the field at, <sighs> everyone's reporting the same thing but they when they investigate there's nothing got, but we've now, these are reports of this apparition or activity. Yeah, I know, obviously, they, they call this sort of thing the stone tape theory, and they're, they're basically saying that the walls are absorbing the emotion or the, the motion of what actually happened in the stone walls, and it sort of replays it over again. But, I, you know, I know, Kerry, you don't really go in for this stone tape theory and think it's... Um, I don't I'll, believe really. you've but, got to look uh, at the mechanics I, of that. That's that's my perspective on stone tape. It, I, I do think though um, that again, it depends on what the walls are made of, or it could also be we, we've got a lot of natural, um, you know, we've got like woods and things like that 
in the house as well, and that they were all living at one point, and maybe their vibrations recalled it as well. So not just stone can recall things, but other natural resources. Mm. I've always and said maybe that. In a, I've maybe always... like a combination. Yes. That, that sort of helps. But you have to look at the mechanics of how something gets recorded and then how something can get played back. Mm. And storage of that, that as well. We've look, I've looked into this, um, or oh, it's an ongoing research, <laughs> like a dip in and out of over years, um, is the mechanics of that. It's all in good saying, yeah, well, you know, it's the crystal in the rock that records it, does it? Or, yeah. Well, what was the mechanism that allowed that recording? And then what triggered the replay? You know, you've got to look at those factors. It's but very then you, easy you don't to blanket. Is, is there crystal in your wall? It might just be a concrete mix. Quite possibly. It might be chipboard. Do you know, <laughs> it could be anything. You know, you'd need to look at that and maybe look at the ground as well and, you know, maybe see what other natural resources are in your walls or your on, windows. On the land. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe, yeah. I, personally, I personally don't think uh, the stone tape theory has stood the test of time. I believe it had its place when it first came out because it was it was quite sort of, uh, oh, yeah, perhaps this is it. But uh, people have sort of looked at this and yourself and, as you say, Kerry, you've looked at this and uh, it it seems to produce more questions than, um, than it does answers. I mean, because you've got people now saying, well, it's a whole factor of things that can trigger it. Well... Yes, it probably would, and it would have to be a very complicated set of factors to actually trigger something like this. And uh, where do you start? I mean, people sort of say, well, it's to do with sunspots or atmospheric conditions. I mean, you know, it it seems to be you have to be very precise to actually get this effect. It, it could be. It could, the you know, the, the, the vibrations, everything could be stored in the natural resources in the room. And then when there's a particularly... Um, bad sun day or something when they've got um when they fly out the the flares and the radiation and i don't know it might mm -hmm. increase the speed of the tachyons and it might be the tachyons that trigger it what's a tachyon what's a t is that something from doctor who no 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 it's a um it's a very small um oh, i don't know what what way, way to describe it it's like an atom, basically, mm -hmm. and it will literally travel through everything. Oh, right. And tachyons come, I, I assume, tachyons come from the sun, and they, they just spill out all over the place, and it, the, the, the planet's <clears throat> bombarded with them constantly, and oh. it will travel through everything. Oh, I'll have to look up and see yeah. if they've got an app on tachyons. that. Look, look tachyons up. Yeah, I'll have to have a look into that. Does this buy into the quantum they've done, physics? They've done, a lot of, they've done a lot of research with tachyons and um, in that Hadron Collider. All right, oh, okay. what, the Hadron Collider at CERN? Uh, yeah, because they um, discovered the God particle. Um, particle as well. Yeah. So, again, you know, that, that could have some... I mean, I don't know too much about it, that particular particle but you know the tachyon is another particle mm. so yeah. it might be worth looking into those as well oh just saying wow i'm impressed <laughs> is all i can say on that one i've not heard of that term before um yeah. so what did i learn today tachyons <laughs> yeah <laughs> tachyons. uh there is a quantum physics related theory on the stone tape theory that explains energy as particles of light that are dormant until they are stimulated by an outside variable under the proper conditions. Possibly like a tachyon. Possibly like a tachyon. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right, everybody? We're going to have to have well, a there you go. We've time. debunked that. Not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. But I do think it... I, I wouldn't dismiss it, but I would say it would be very complicated to explain the mechanics of a stone tape theory. And that's yeah. the point um, with that one. But to give you an idea of a case of residual hauntings... Um, I looked at the Brown Lady of Rainham Hall. Very famous photograph, everybody. Mm -hmm. Very famous photograph. Um, the whole backstory, again, we've got a lovely little history of a wife committed adultery. Her husband was like violent temper, locked her up, died, 
blah, 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 blah. But her ghost has been seen like loads of times around Christmas. She's a, she likes a little bit of a Christmas fest. Now, is, 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 she, is she the ghost of Christmas past? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she must like the eggnog. She probably comes out for the eggnog. Uh, maybe yeah, she that, does. That's <laughs> or she's coming out for Santa. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she yeah. does. <laughs> but there's a very famous photograph of the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall. I think it's one that if you're into the paranormal, you would know she's on the staircase. You know, that lovely wispy figure on the staircase. Um, but now they've looked at it and they think it's a double exposure. So it's not actually, um, they think it's a hoax, the photograph. Well, yeah, yeah sort of more than likely, yeah, it is a hoax. I'm but, sorry to disappoint. <laughs> well, that photograph is, but it doesn't change the fact that people have seen the brown lady plenty no. of times over the years. And actually, when I spoke to Raynham Hall a few years back, they wouldn't discuss it. We don't talk about it. We don't discuss it. Well, they actually said that to you. Yeah. I actually spoke no. to the lady of the hall at the time. And uh, she yeah, was I like, mean, I, not... again, I, you know, that that's one of the pictures that did interest me um, years ago as a child. Um, and that's sort of how I got into the paranormal. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I never thought she was a brown lady. She looked rather white to me. In the photograph, she looked very white, didn't she? But I think other yeah. people have like put it down to how it's appeared to them. Mm. But she always, her face is very um, iconic for people. It's, she's got mm. yeah, very is... empty eye sockets. I, I must admit, I, I do think you know it could have been some sort of light re- light reflection. Because it is off to the side. Um, I mean, I don't know how they took the photograph. They might have used the flash. Mm. And it could have bounced back. Because it does look like it's the, um, come off the woodwork. Well, the photograph was actually taken for a magazine article in the 1930s uh, for yeah. Country Life, I believe, or, or, or magazine and like that. I mean, but, and... Uh, yeah, photography is just sort of coming and... You know, they wouldn't have very many examples mm. of that but sort of the, phenomena happening. But so I do the, think it could be just a light reflection back. But the back story is uh, that photograph was taken after they actually saw it descending the stairs. Mm. They, you know, they and they actually were witnessing what the photograph actually, you know, so they pointed at the camera and shot, and that is what allegedly the photograph they took. But uh, So they're, they're saying they actually see that coming down the stairs yes yeah. yes she has been uh, witnessed a lot there are cases what, cam- and... what camera did they use was it one of those like box cameras or yeah something? Uh, the yes took, like, uh, a knife well it up. <laughs> no it would have been sort of uh well it's a magazine article so i should imagine at the time a, a good 1930s type camera whatever they would have used yeah so what, what yeah, but, camera what is it one of those ones like the big box? I yeah. mean, I don't. I'm it's not a box into on a tripod. So it's a big box on the yeah, tripod where you've got a plate and, that sits inside it. Yeah, and then he's got the cover to go over his head, sort of thing. I don't believe it was a cover over his head. I think it was just like a click right, remote, okay. like yeah. So the, the flash would literally be a bit of gun pad or something. In, <laughs> no, in, that's a bit earlier, Paul. Uh, yeah. right, okay. We're talking the nineteen thirties. Yeah, it's not quite that old a camera, but it is. As I say the photograph itself is generally now considered to be a double exposure. Yeah, on, I, on I, the I plate. wouldn't. Because I mean, it would have taken a little bit of time to set that up, and if they got this ghost walking down the stairs, you would have thought by the time they got a the camera set up and everything that. The ghost has made a sandwich in the kitchen by then. Oh, she's like, come on, but, I'm waiting yeah, so, for my photograph. But you look <laughs> at the original photo. Look at his fingers are going, come on, make up, make up. <laughs> <laughs> but you look at the original photo, it is perfectly framed as well, yeah. which uh, gives it a bit of suspicion behind it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but it doesn't change the fact that the, the apparition or the figure has been seen time and time again on the staircase. So it's not mm. that... Yeah. They pick, They just happen to be in the right place at the right time. That is where she's seen, and she's been seen mm-hmm. a lot. I mean, staff have left the the um, the hall before now because they've seen her and it scared them. You know, lots of recorded claims of seeing this. You know, and we're not talking like 
um, we're talking lords and ladies and people like that who have witnessed this and seen it, you know, seen her, we'll say her, you know, so Mm -hmm. they've not just gone on the off chance. The fact that that something is occurring that's unusual, just because that photograph is fake doesn't mean that the haunting is fake. Do you know what I mean? No, no. But right unless there. you was able to get in there and do an extended investigation yourself, you're not going to be able to ascertain what that is. And also, with residual hauntings, it's whenever. It's not got a set time, a set day, a say, you know, it's, it, it's just, it seems to happen. So again, could it be a trigger that it's there but not there? You're externalising something that's triggered in your head. Yeah. I don't know. That is certainly something I'd lean towards. It's certainly because uh, the only thing we know about sort of people that actually see apparitions, the only common factor is the observer. (laughs) So there has to be some mechanism going on with yourself. So I think as well that just the mere fact that they don't want it um, investigated or they won't talk about it, does that mean, I mean, it depends on what their motivation is, that, you know, do they actually know what it is and they don't want people to find out the truth? Or maybe they're just private. They're just or, private. Well, exactly. and... that's, that's what I mean. You have to find out what their motivation is. Because, I mean, I know we've done, uh, well, I've done, I've done an investigation quite recently um, towards the end of last year and we got some really good activity. And the fact that we're not allowed to go back to investigate it because, you know, we, we was given the runaround and, you know, mm-hmm. he doesn't want to investigate it. It's almost like, do you really know what you was, maybe, you know, you could be faking it then. But it's, it's something that it just goes on in your mind. Do you know what I mean? It, it's nothing that I can prove because I can't get back in there to investigate it. But then why won't you let me back there? Mm. You know, and it, it's, it's just one of these things that you think of. Um but again, you know, you've got you've got to look at the motive for what, why they won't let you there. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I think with this residual haunting, because it might not happen like every five minutes. It could happen once every ten years or something. You know what I mean? Mm. Or very, very rarely. So to then mm. have a team go in to investigate that properly may feel a bit well, it doesn't happen very often, so <laughs> it's not really an issue and we're not that bothered because... Yeah. I mean, the lady herself, I, she wasn't very forthcoming in conversation, I will say that. She was very, nope, nope, don't discuss it, thank you very much, goodbye, kind of uh, conversation mm-hmm. was what it was. But if she's never witnessed it, she might be putting it down to it's just a folklore story. You know, it's just something that happened yeah, years exactly. ago. It, I've never witnessed it, so it doesn't happen. So there's no point of team coming in to look at it. And because no, nobody's would, been bothered be nice, by it. It would be nice if they, she maybe approached someone like the SPR or the Ghost Club or ASSAP or someone like that who's based on the scientific and they can research into the photograph. They could look at the properties. That's... They could... Do, there's loads of different things that they could investigate. But it's all very different. different. Don't forget, though, this is, you know, Raynham Hall has been there for like years and years and years. So you've got different family at different times. When the photograph was taken, maybe that bit of the family was quite open to having it looked into, which is hence why yeah. we've got a photograph, because that is why they were there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the people that are now, you know, the ownership has now passed to this branch of the family. If they've never witnessed it, it might be all like just a family tale. Do you know what I mean? So you you yeah. can't say it was fake or anything yeah, but it's else still, like that. It's, it's still just... something that well, it still would be interesting to look into, even if it is just a family folk tale. Mm. Oh yeah. Then you know you're looking at it from a historical point of view, and you you know they they could conclude from that that okay yeah it's just a story. Mm. You know. But, but places like really Raynham Hall, no, and, but, you know, yeah. Mm. But their motivations, I mean, it's probably a commercial property now. It's a, it's an historic building and their focus is on day trips, you know, open during the day and just have sort of visitors around and stuff like that. And that's all they want to do. I mean, yeah, but a ghost story won't hurt anybody, will it? I mean, look at the Tower of London. 
<laughs> thousands of people turn up to that daily, and look how many ghost stories are attached to that. Yeah, but they he won't let you was, investigate it, though, it, will it, they? No, no, they don't let you investigate it because people already live there. Yeah, it's an historic but, monument. Well, no, I mean, I, I'm sure that there have been people that have investigated it because I know someone has done it. Um, yeah. But they won't let you in because it's still a residential place for people. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, that That's their explanation for it, and I can understand that. But there's so many ghost stories there. It even draws more people in because of the stories. Yeah. And it, yeah. it does tend to be like the top ten... Um, places if you say to people where if you could investigate anywhere in the world where would it be Tara London is always up there right absolutely oh, and yeah. just just so happens that I've done a blog on the ghosts of um, Tara London Funny and it's that. in the, the on <laughs> never the yeah, where paranormal people... uh, paranormalconcept.com so if anyone wants to go back and have a look at the blog page it's um, Tara London there Okay. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I love it. Nice little plug. <laughs> but when you talked we... about a ghost story um, as being, you know, used to somebody's advantage, there is a theory that the brown lady has been used by smugglers to keep people away from that area. Yeah. I mean, yes. Again, that's another possibility. But then if someone was to look into the, the history and, you know, they, they could turn out and say, well, okay, at the time, the house belonged to so and so, and he was a bit of a rogue. He was a trickster. He loved all that sort of stuff. Maybe you know we don't we can't say for sure, but maybe he did set it up, and and that's where your legend began, sort of thing. Or you know he was a dodgy smuggler. And but the thing you know, is, Paul, you can actually do this. You don't actually sort of have to have full access to the actual buildings and stuff you go to. I mean, you know, sort of yeah, but I like to be stuff. nosy. <laughs> you like to be nosy. You can research these um, cases, as Richard says. You don't have to visit a location to research a location, particularly with cases that have got a long extended history of hauntings. You've only got to, I say only got to, it's quite a mammoth task, but trawl through and find people, you know, like particularly with Rainer Hall, you know, it goes over years. It doesn't just go over like one, it's not like a one off. It, it tends to a residual haunting would be something that multiple people over multiple time period have witnessed time and time again but follows the same follows the same um remit as it were yeah I, I know what you're saying but i'd still like to go to the location especially like if i've done some research on it and found smuggler tunnels underneath and i could say things like um you know it's behind that wall can we knock that one down <laughs> yeah but this is why you're not allowed into locations this is why yeah. you don't get in anywhere and then actually, you know, going back to Poltergeist, you know, sorry to bring that box back out again, but, you know, oh, again, that away. Yeah, I know, sorry, but it's been like, again, it's been reported that you start doing renovations on a property and it tends to yeah. kick off activity, you know, particularly older locations this is, I don't mm. think that, that goes down to your 1970s um, semi, you know what I mean, but old locations does tend to um, have that, you know, mythology that if you start doing any works to the place, then activity seems to kick off because they don't mm. like it, spirits, apparently, if you do that. Oh, uh, if you move stuff around, yeah. Yeah, but that, then that would go under in, um, poltergeist or intelligent haunting, not residual haunting. Yeah. So, you you know, you've got to start looking at it. But, you know, it's it's all very strange, isn't it, when you start trying to put something in a box? Yeah. Mm. And personal experience... I mean, we've talked about Whitney Algood quickly because we're running out of time on our first half of the show. You know, we, we know how unreliable witness statements are. They think they've seen something or walked along. You know, particularly pre-electricity, they're walking around with candles, for goodness sakes, for life, oh, yeah. and then they see something and it scares the bejesus out of them. And, you know, then all of a sudden we've got a witness account of, you know, a personal encounter with an alleged entity. It kind of like that in itself kind of throws up red flags and questions. Yeah, well, yeah, and particularly when you are examining stories from sort of like the Victorian era and stuff like that, because uh, the environment these properties were in were probably a lot different from, um, from what they are today. So they're probably more forested, more wooded and stuff, and there would have been a lot more sort of... Uh, the areas would have been quieter, so there could 
would have been a lot more stuff that could have been mistaken for supposed supernatural occurrences. And yet we're still out there hunting for those supernatural occurrences even to this day in old buildings. So, you know, it's one of those. Anyway, we have actually come to the end of the first half of the show. We're going to take a quick break. Join us. Put these boxes away. Put those boxes away because we're going to get out a load of other ones. A load of other ones. That was good grammar, (laughs) wasn't it? (laughs) Um, (laughs) After the break. Um, And enjoy, is all I can say. We'll be right back. Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Now, before the break, we we looked at poltergeist, we looked at intelligent hauntings, and we looked at um, all sorts of cases in linked with that. But we're going to get the next box out. What box have you got there, uh, Paul? Yeah, the, <laughs> ne- Paul? the next box. Oh, well, I'll, put all the other, <laughs> I'll put all the other boxes away now, so don't, we won't go back <laughs> over those. <laughs> Um, the next box we've got is the reoccurring hauntings. So I'm going to pass that over to Richard to delve into, I think. Right, let's have a look in here now. Mm, interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's stuff you've all seen before, isn't it? Yeah, I always saw uh, Yeah, deja vu. Oh. <laughs> right, uh, there was... reoccurring. Oh, you've got me going now. Uh, reoccurring ha- and, and hauntings actually appear to be actually quite similar to the residual hauntings you actually get out there, but the reoccurring ha- and hauntings are more associated with events that have happened at a set point in time and are sort of like alleged to actually reoccur, usually perhaps on a certain date. And these are usually sort of uh, connected to historic events and quite usually battles usually come up in this, uh, sort of phantom battles which reoccur on the dates of uh, the said the said battle and uh, one battle of interest here is actually the battle of hastings which is said to have a uh, a knight on horseback that appears on the anniversary of the battle now i've actually been to battle abbey where the actual battle took place and uh, the basic sort of sort of battle was uh, sort of harold came down from the north of england to fend off the invasion of the Normans down uh, just outside of uh, Hastings. And uh, when they actually arrived at the battlefield, the the Saxons actually did actually uh, set up in quite a prepared position on top of a hill. And uh, the Normans were actually at the base. And uh, by any stretch of the imaginations, the Saxons actually should have won this. Are you sorry, right, Kerry? I'm sorry, I'm having a giggle because this is like right up your alley, this, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. Okay. Yeah. And um, well, basically, and um, throughout the day, the Normans were like sort of just sort of advancing slightly up the hill, but the Saxons were actually holding their position and not sort of actually coming down to meet them. So, what the Normans actually done was actually use their archers to actually, and they fired in the air. So, they were firing firing lobbing shots into the Saxon enclosure. And from this, this is where perhaps the story of uh, King Harold getting the arrow in the eye comes from. But this is probably not true. But this did actually affect the outcome of the battle because uh, they were starting to make uh, casualties on the Saxons. You, you know why they really won, didn't you? Like that. Because they had their Weetabix. <laughs> 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 oh, dear me. And that's another story, uh, listeners. Oh, oh, Paul, tell them the side story to that, please. <laughs> okay, okay. The, the side story is our very own Richard Clements, years ago, happened to be an extra in an advert for Weetabix. And it was the one where the, you had all the soldiers, and they're like, they had their Weetabix. They've had their Weetabix. Oh my God, they've had their Weetabix and went away. <laughs> <laughs> And Richard was one yeah. of the extras in that. So uh, yeah. I can't explain that joke. 
Many moons ago, that was. And uh, <laughs> right, where was I? Yes. And uh, well, to cut a long story short, I'm not going to babble on any more because uh, now everyone knows about my acting prowess. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. But um, the Normans actually had cavalry, which was pretty new on the battlefield back in uh, 1066, and uh, the Saxons weren't actually used to it. So the Normans actually went up to engage in the Saxon Wall and actually retreated and this was a faint retreat the saxons actually followed them down allowing the cavalry to get round the side and actually uh totally encircle the uh, saxon hordes and they actually put most of them to the sword including poor king harold who was more than likely was killed uh by a cavalryman oh. and that is the basic story behind that but he was sort of just slain and uh that was and that was that but uh but it's stories like this that actually sort of uh, people sort of uh, will actually sort of go to these places on the anniversaries of these battles. And uh, there are certain battles, uh, Edge Hill, which is an English Civil War battle. And uh, I believe Culloden as well in Scotland is also another one which is believed to have reoccurring hauntings. But <clears throat> there is a problem with this, I I actually feel, and it's an old one I always like to bring up, is uh, if if they do reoccur on the anniversary, uh, which is all well and good up until about uh, the uh, 1772 when they actually changed the calendar. Ah, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, if these battles are still reoccurring on the date, uh, they are 12 days out. Twelve days, everybody. Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on sort of that or sort of reoccurring hauntings in general and what your well, thoughts. Well, my, my thought, my thought on this was would be sort of not hauntings as such, but more, um, more, more to do with time, like a time and, slip, and like a time slip, or. Um, a fracture in time, so you can like glimpse through and see little snippets of the battle. Yeah, I would sort of go along that sort of thing, but I wouldn't actually put it down to the actual date. I think the dates are sort of in the history books, and that's sort of what people sort of tend yeah. to mm. sort of relate to. But if there are apparitions appearing on these sites, uh, they could appear all year round. I would say, if yeah. they are. So Trapped in but then, if, if you think, I mean, there are, there are theories that um, time happens all at the same time and it's not linear as most people believe. If that's the case, then yeah, as you said, it's it's a case of you know, it could happen any time and the, these fractures or openings in time and you can see through it would happen any, any time, mm. yeah. There's also that, and uh. Again, uh, after these battles were fought, there was a lot of sort of propaganda sort of uh, influence to actually say these battles were being refought mm -hmm. for whatever reason. It was usually for political reasons. I mean, this is uh, particularly shows up in the uh, Phantom Battle of Edge Hill, yeah. and, uh, which is quite a famous one. And <clears throat> everyone will recite this one in the paranormal community, but it's actually not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually been uh, taken back to a couple of uh, broadside ballads they were yeah. which were sort of propaganda broadsheets of um, uh, of their day and again we see the authors of the time were overlaying fictitious events on real timelines mm. this is where a lot of the confusion comes from wow okay. there we go everybody <laughs> the other thing so, I would so like to you're, say what you're saying this... is the whole series of black adders fictitious Yes, probably. Yeah, because well, <laughs> yeah. that, that started, obviously, at the Battle of Bosworth Field. Yes. <laughs> well, the, what yeah. I'd like to say about this one is um, there's a lot of reported reoccurring hauntings at Gettysburg in America, right? Yes. Now, a lot of people put these down to this stone tape theory that we discussed um, before on mm -hmm. the visual, but the recording element a lot of people cite is quartz. But in okay. particular... In that case particular, in Gettysburg, it's got, like, no quartz in the area. Oh, okay. right, yeah. But there is, a, but there there is a, a theory that it could be silica 
that is the recording mm. element. But that would obviously need a lot more research. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that little point up as well. Really. Oh, also, also look- um, in, in the first half of the show, I mentioned about tachyons, didn't I? Yes, you the did. Yes. I, I have looked into it over the break and stuff, and basically it, it's not tachyons, it's neutrinos that I was thinking of. Oh, another term I've uh, not heard of. Neutrinos. <laughs> yeah. right. so, oh, the old tachyons and neutrinos, Richard, eh? Hey? <laughs> yes, we've got it all. Um, yeah. mm. So this, what you said before about the Gettysburg and the, you know, say quartz, there's no quartz, but you said, and what was the other element you said, Karen? Silica. Would there be silica in granite? Yeah. Because a lot of the Gettysburg escarpment is actually built on a granite escarpment. Yeah, silica is, is like the most prominent element around the globe. Mm-hmm. More so than quartz. You know what I mean? Yeah. So everyone goes, oh, it's quartz, because quartz is like everywhere, which it generally is, but mm-hmm. not as much as silica. And silica is a natural element of quartz. So when they started looking at it, they started thinking what element is more abundant in a lot more mm. other elements as part of another kind of element, as it were, or another mineral. And it was silica that came out top of the list. So oh. the, the theory of quartz being... The, the main recording element is not um, not really accurate. It's actually the silica that is um, part of it. So, do you, but again, would you feel no that idea comes from sort of like the spiritual connection that people have with quartz? Yeah, probably. And because yeah, they know that quartz is a recording element and used in uh, modern technology as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's um, used on circuit boards and TVs and all sorts of things. Um, quartz gets used for it's well known for that Mm -hmm. i think that's an assumption people made they jumped on that well if it's able to store data on computers and stuff like that why can't they why couldn't it in nature record something yeah so i can understand their reasoning but they're forgetting the process to store the data yeah it doesn't just automatically store data it there's a process that makes it store the data onto the quartz so you've got to then explain how in nature that process takes place. Before I think we'd can... have to look into that. I think we'd have to look into that and maybe do the, you know, when the new Ghostbusters movie comes out, we we could relive our old show on how to, is it possible to catch a ghost? Well, there you go. Yeah, because we did come up with some interesting um, theories on that, didn't we, of whether or not it yeah, would be that, possible. Yeah, but that was on our old network. So yeah. that's something that we could, we could look into again and take into account, you know, what what you've just discussed. Yeah. It, you know, if, if it is possible for something like that to hold on to, like, a recording of some sort, then could it actually be feasible and possible to catch a ghost as well? But that's maybe, yeah, I think we should look into that on the Ghostbusters. Yeah. So. Oh, oh yeah. right, yeah. Mm, well, yeah. Ghostbusters, oh. unfortunately, I'm not in that movie, so... That's no. not part of my uh, sort no, of resume no. of acting experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll relive that subject. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go back to that one because we've learned a lot more since then as well. So yeah, uh, we, may, we may well be able to uh, throw out some interesting concepts and ideas for people. Anyway, moving on, time to put the reoccurring hauntings box away, I feel. Oh, I've just got that out. I know, I know. I'm a girl. I wish you'd to... make your mind up. I'm a girl. What's up? What can I say? Thing, you know, moving yeah. on quickly today. <laughs> okay, so what are we doing now? So pull out the historical hauntings box. Oh, that's right at the top. I've got to get the ladder out now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Now, these... <laughs> These ghosts um, are t- typically of famous people in period clothing that seem to appear in, in relevant locations to that historical character. Um, the main one being, um, well, I say the main one, this one, she's very prolific, is this girl, is all I can say. Prolific in life, prolific in death, what can you say? It's good old Anne Boleyn. Now, um, she's reportedly seen in several locations around the UK. Yeah, on different, mm, well, you know, different dates, different times. She's all sorts. She's all over the place, basically. Isn't isn't that one at the Tower of London? Yeah, she's said to be seen at the Tower of London. 
Yeah, and incidentally, I've written a blog about the Tower of London. <laughs> oh my yeah. god! Oh my god! Have you? <laughs> yeah, you can you can go and have a read of it. It's on um, the website, which is www.paranormalconcept.com. <laughs> is it? Really? Yeah. Okay. It is absolutely. Well, go over and check it out. Second plug of the day, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Now, she was beheaded on Tower Green on the 19th of May in 1536, and she has been seen at the Tower. Mm. Yes, with her head tucked underneath her arm, I believe. There was a song, I think, many years ago. I don't actually believe that bit's true. I believe it's just a bit of a folklore folklore tale that's sort of... Well, good uh, song. It might be a good song, but you know. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, yeah, that is. I think you should write a blog on that one. Tale, you... Yeah, but she's. Yeah, I could do. I mean, I don't know where to post it. Though. Oh, yes, I do. www.paranormalconcept.com. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> <right. laughs> oh my God, they're getting good at this like promotion malarkey, aren't they? Anyway. Um, the most spectacular story relating good old Anne is actually at the Tower of London. Now, he saw a light flickering in the Chapel Royal one night. No, it's the Chapel Royal, not Royal. <laughs> I mean, James Bond over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a casino, yeah. It's the Casino Royale one night. No, it was the Chapel Royal um, one night. Um, he climbed up a ladder to look through the window and he saw a procession of knights and ladies dressed in costume pacing through the chapel. And their leader... Couldn't see her face, but he said she resembled Anne Boleyn in portraits he'd seen, but he didn't see her face. So I'm kind of like a bit confused by that point. Could have been anybody, mm. basically, but he put it down to Anne yeah. Boleyn. Um, she's also maybe supposed it's Henry VIII to... on, his, on the weekend. <laughs> maybe. <Yeah. laughs> she's also supposed to walk from the Queen's House to the Chapel of St. Peter at Vinicula. Vincula. <laughs> There's Kerry's pronunciations again. Yeah, Vinicula, yeah. I would call that Vinicula. <laughs> Um, where her grave is under the altar. All right. Right. And a soldier on duty near the lieutenant's lodgings, these are all in the Tower of London, um, was supposed to have challenged a white figure and didn't get response, so he bayoneted the figure and then it just went straight through and didn't touch anything and he was a bit scared, really, about that. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. That, would... <laughs> <laughs> that, that particular site it is in my blog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's several at the Tower of London itself. Now, she's also supposed to be um, at Hever Castle. My favourite, I will give a shout out to Hever Castle. It's beautiful, beautiful yeah. place to go and visit. It's one of my favourite places to go and visit. It's not that far from me. Um, I'm very lucky that it's within travelling distance to go um, and visit um, Hever Castle. It is absolutely beautiful, and it has a whole history, regardless of the, the, the link to Anne Boleyn. But she, every Christmas, she is supposed to appear at Heva Castle, and she's supposed to manifest beneath a great oak. She's always a manifestation, is Anne? Yes, I sort of gathered that as well, but uh, isn't she at Windsor Castle as well? Yep, she's supposed to stand at the window of the Dean's Cloister at Windsor Castle. We're, we're going to go there on a road trip. We are. Well, we have promised ourselves, haven't we? Yeah, we're yeah. I've, I've written to the Queen and just asked if she don't mind us popping in for tea. Good, oh, good, good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll just wait yeah. for my reply, and then we'll we'll arrange that and go and see Her Majesty, and we'll have a word with Anne Boleyn while we're there if she's around at the time. Well, she yeah. is. You know, she'll probably come back with the response of um, "Yes, no problem, Paul." But let's just wait and see when we're allowed to. <laughs> oh, yeah, of, of course, you know, you, we, we've got to wait till this lockdown lifted, but, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it'd be nice to go and have a natter with her. Mm-hmm. It would I'll be. Bet, I'll bet she's really bored I being isolated with Philip. Oh, <laughs> anyway, she's also supposed to, not the Queen, this is Queen, uh, uh, Anne Boleyn, sorry, back to Anne. Um, Hampton Court Palace, she's supposed to haunt as well. She's been allegedly seen wearing a blue or a black dress. Now, this is where you, the, the, the story goes. Sometimes she's seen headless. It's actually Hampton Court Palace, not the Tower of London. Oh, not always, it. though. She's been seen with or without. <clears throat> hmm. If you know what I mean. She's always got a head. It's, it's just whether it, she's carrying it or not. <laughs> isn't there another location near to you, Kerry, that um, has Anne Boleyn? Rochford Hall. Yeah. Rochford Hall yeah. in Essex. It's a manor house. I believe it's a golf course now 
Um, I think the is, manor yeah. house is actually like the golf club house. Used to be investigated, but I don't think it is anymore. Oh, I, I don't know. I've, I've not heard for a while. It's one of those locations that were about for a while and then just dropped, like Highlands House, for example. Yeah. You don't know, hear it's... much about that place. No. Do. Yeah. So whether or not they sort of went through a little spat of allowing investigations in and then decided to um, stop, I don't know. But Rochford Hall, anyway, she's supposed to be there. Now, this is the place where King Henry VIII first saw Anne Boleyn. Mm. Right, well, met her, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, he oh, first cast yeah. his eyes upon her. And then, well, the whole history came out of that, didn't it, my guy? I wonder if that's how the Essex girl got their reputation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. And if that but... wasn't enough, she's also supposed to be at Bickling, Bling, Bling, Bling Blink, oh, I can't even say it. Blinkling Hall. Blinkling Hall, yes. Yeah, which uh, is in Norfolk. And right. this is and this mm. is a headless spectre um, arriving, and she apparently arrives in a phantom carriage, drawn by a headless coachman and four head. They're all headless, basically. So you've got right. this carriage with uh, four horses, a, a coachman, and her, but none of them have got heads. Oh, right. Now, that's actually that's supposed to be a reoccurring haunting. That's actually yeah. supposed to happen on... Uh, this is what I mean. With Anne Boleyn, you've got, like, so many things that are supposed to have happened on the anniversary of her execution. You know what I mean? In lots of different places. Now, is this a question of um, misidentification? So people are seeing something. They put it down to the famous person, Link. When it isn't, <laughs> it could be anybody. Oh, yeah. I think these sort of anecdotes will be added on after the event. I should imagine if somebody sort of, they would report seeing something unusual, not be too descriptive about it. And uh, as the story is connected, it's automatically assumed it is that. Mm. You know, and perhaps, you know, they're embellished by by outside influences once someone reports seeing something. Possibly. Or is it because it um, raises the profile? You know, I mean, it's another... You know, if you go visit Rochford Hall, for example, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, at, at yeah. the time, it's like the haunting of Anne Boleyn at Rochford Hall. It could be an evolution through from the paranormal community because there is that history there um, yes. and there is maybe activity there. They attribute it to the most famous person to give it a more um, sensationalised lure, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Because... If you were to see an apparition with no head, I mean, it could be anyone. Exactly. All you, all you would really know would be roughly the period because of what yes. they're wearing, if they're wearing, yeah, what they're wearing. Yeah. If it's Tudor costume, you can sort of make an educated guess of it's Tudor period. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, mm. It's a lady. Mm-hmm. And that kind of would be it, I would think. That would be it. Even if it had a head, you know, unless you're very, very sort of savvy and know your history and stuff and what she looked like, you know. Yeah, I'm not a great sort of fan of uh, when hauntings are attributed to certain individuals. Mm. Never have been. I've often of, of the thought that it could be anyone. I'm not disputing that something is going on, but, you know, to a certain individual, no, I don't think. I think that's too. It, it does make specific. it suspicious when people, um, you know, say, "Oh, yeah, we've got a spirit," but then it's of someone famous. It's like, well, it could be anybody. Yeah, I think the other thing you need to bear in mind is like a lot of the um, historical figures are portraits, are all, yeah. all portraits of what was drawn, and it was well known that the painters would actually. Be very kind, shall we say. Oh, yes. And there were historical references to people being caught out. I think even Henry VIII, one of his wives, he was sent a portrait and he agreed yeah. to marry her on the portrait. But when she arrived, yeah, he was yeah. like, what? That is not what you sent me. That is pure catfishing. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did that have was... And that... isn't there um, one of... I, I can't remember if it was like a king or someone else that was beheaded, and then they realised they haven't actually got a portrait of them. Yeah, so, so was, they literally uh, sat the guy down and put his head back and let the... Uh, yeah, so I've actually seen that portrait. It's the portrait of the Duke of Monmouth. That's it, yeah. The, 
who was the illegitimate son of uh, Charles the Second, who uh, launched a rebellion in the West Country, and yeah, he, I know he, he failed. Can you imagine he, it? He's he did plump. look a bit pale. He put his head yeah. back on his body, or maybe not yeah. on a body. Maybe they just gave him the head. Who knows? I mean, see what you can do with that, because we've yeah. got to get a portrait while he was alive. <laughs> but uh, Henry the Eighth. Uh, Instant that was with Anne of Cleves, I believe, his fourth wife, and he sent Holbein over to Flanders, well, which is now modern day Holland, to actually capture her likeness because, you know, back then marriages were arranged, it was all a done deal, so, you know, so, but uh, then she turned up the night before the wedding, Henry dressed in disguise and uh, went into her bedchamber just to have a quick look see and was quite shocked. And from then on, she was known in court as the Flanders Mayor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> poor lady. <laughs> but it just goes to show that maybe the portraits we have of these people are not necessarily... So you can go, oh, yeah. it looked like Anne Boleyn because I've seen a portrait of yeah. her, so I know what she looks like. She may not have been that close to the portrait to what we think. No. Exactly. She, I actually have seen portraits of Anne Boleyn, and I actually thought, how the hell did she capture a king's eye with that look? I was expecting something a lot, a lot prettier. Um, no disrespect, well, Anne Boleyn. Sorry. You can but... imagine what it's like. So back in the day, you would commission an artist to come and do a portrait, mm. and then you know, and then you know, yeah, and they are sort of going to use the uh, sort of the historical equivalent of a Photoshop of their time. Yeah, <laughs> I'll put it that's putting it nicely at times, right? Yeah. We need to put that box away and move on to the next one. Oh, that's right. That's at the bottom. That's fine. Okay, so we're going on to haunted items. Your favourite topic, Paul. Oh, I know. And incidentally... (laughs) 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 On on, on a serious note, we have got a book out as well. And I'm sure there's lots of blogs in there (laughs) about haunted items, um, which is available on Amazon. It's called The Book of Parasearch. Mm, There you go, everybody. So get the book, especially in lockdown, because obviously you might you might need something to do or read, especially if you're on your paranormal fix. There's lots of stuff in there. And I do read. believe on our website is www.paranormalconcept.com. You've got a link to actually yep. go and purchase okay. this book. <laughs> Absolutely, there, there is. Yeah, and it's available Amazon worldwide, all over. <coughs> the place. Sorry, except Ray. Australia, apparently. Mm. Well, we don't know why. Poor old Australia no. got left out of the mix there. But anyway, haunted items. It's a controversial topic. Go on eBay. You can buy a plethora of haunted dolls or haunted teddy bears or haunted objects. There are museums popping up all over the place. And people put great stock in the fact that they may possibly own a haunted item. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I think mean... out, out of all those, there are, I mean, there's three that I know of in the UK. Um, there's probably a few more as well that I don't know of, um, but out you know out of those three, there's only one that actually doesn't claim that they're haunted objects, and it's just a case of if you pick something up from it, you, you know you can experiment with it, and you, you know you're free to touch and move the items and you know use them for experiments and stuff. The other two museums are not too keen on you doing that, but. You know, there's something for everybody in those places. There is. I'm not criticising them because this actually leads no, they're, us they're down. This actually leads us down into something that's well known in the field, and this is something. It's actually quite spiritual, and mm. about energy exchange, and it's called psychometry. Yeah. Right. Now, this has actually been looked at quite extensively. In fact, quite a long time ago as well, I said I will point my listeners in the direction of a gentleman called William Denton. Okay. Oh, Will. Yeah, I know Will. Yeah? Good old Will. Now, he did experiments with, um, basically, he would get objects like rocks or stones or fossils or things like that, wrap them in paper, and then pass them on to whoever was around. And He mainly used his sister at this time he didn't tell her what was in these these packages and ask her to tell him what impressions if any she got right and how did she uh what would her results of this sort of experiment i suppose you can call it very interesting oh okay very interesting indeed 
even down to a piece of rock that had some tiny fossils of shells in it, like little ammonites in it. And she was saying, um, oh, I'm seeing lots of shells and things like that. So she was very accurate um, in regards to what So, so basically, he wrapped, he wrapped these objects up and she had to guess what was inside. Yeah, or say like what she what impression, okay. impressions she was getting. Now, she wasn't a medium, she wasn't a trained medium or anything like that. It was just purely an experiment. He also did this with letters as well to see if they could pick up the personality of the people yeah. or the person that was writing the letter. And they had some great accurate, accurate results from that too, um, which led him down to um, the understanding, is that the right word? Um, mm-hmm. Or the, the the theory that objects maintain energy, whether it's natural energy from like a piece mm. of rock or something that you you know you pick up from a beach or something, to um, an object that's loved dearly or written, and you've transferred some of your own energy into that object. Right, I see. Wouldn't, so there are you... there are studies done on this. But wouldn't you feel that could also plain devil's advocate? That could also work the other way round. It's the recipient you know the person that's handling the object they are sort of seeing or psychically sort of seeing what the object is or what it may be as opposed from the object giving off the energy i mean it's more of a perception from the individual of what the object is it could be either or though couldn't it yeah because well, i'm like thinking you... of because this when, sounds when... very much like the forerunner to like zener cards doesn't it hmm. I was I was going to say like when you give someone a present at Christmas and it's shaped in a wine bottle, it's most often or not a wine bottle. <laughs> but when you wrap, say if you had a rock and you wrapped it, you wouldn't be yeah. able to then go, oh, I'm sensing seashells and blah 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 blah. You're not feeling what's inside it; you're just holding it. It's, there is a difference. And working with crystals myself, crystals do have different energy. You know, they do feel different. Mm-hmm. And I do know that they, they did um, an experiment with some students as well, whether or not they could tell what was metal and what wasn't metal between um, parcels. You know, so they're wrapped right. and they're all muddled up. And then to cut out the te- telepathy link as well, mm-hmm. they would wrap them up, mix them all up. So the parcel that you're giving to the person to try and work out what it is without seeing mm. it, the person who gave it to them didn't know what it was either. Because that was one of the criticisms. When we go back to critical thinking, one of the criticisms were, well, you know what's in that parcel you've just given us. So you could be picking it up from you, not from the item. So they did it by mixing it all up and then not no one knowing what was in the parcel until it got unwrapped. I think it's an experiment that we could do. Easily. Yeah, yeah. It it certainly is. I mean, especially the access to some of the rocks and minerals we've got. (laughs) Thanks to Perry. But... um, But don't you find it interesting, I mean, playing devil's advocate again, that he conducted this experiment with his sister, who would have some sort of knowledge of what uh, he, her brother's into, what sort of stuff he has around and stuff like that. Uh, did he carry out this experiment on a broader sort of the test subjects and yeah. stuff? Yeah, oh, yeah, it went on. It, that's just where it started. Right. It, it led the thought pattern. Do, see, do you believe, then, that objects can be haunted? I don't think they can be haunted. I think they can hold no. energy. And I think there's a very different distinction between the two. I don't well, believe... Well, that's sort of where, where I was... My, my thought process had gone, because it's more energy transference. Yeah. So where, where this person's picked up the rock in the parcel, they're feeling for that energy. And even if that rock belonged to someone else, it, especially in the case of the letters, you, you could pick up the energy of the person that wrote it so by by that logic you know you pick up an item in one of these museums and you're picking up on the energy of the person that had it previously it's a possibility yeah, but... so as such it's it's almost like you're feeling the person that owned it mm. and that's where you get the psychic link and then maybe that could bring forward the spirit I can see what you're sort of saying mm, there, Paul. Yeah. But uh, where sort of, but is there some way? Does but is this energy can it connect or link itself or attach itself to the object? I think this is where well, sort of like if, haunted items sort of. When, this when is you, the main theory behind it. See, when, when I've gone to item. medium nights and stuff, they've said like if you want to speak to someone, just you know think about them. 
mm -hmm. they'll come to you. Mm. So if it's like a family member, you know, you could just think of some happy memories or whatever. And sometimes, you know, they might make themselves known that they're around you at that time. Or it could just happen naturally throughout the day anyway. So I'm, I'm just thinking if you're picking up energy from an object of someone else, because you've got the energy thoughts in your mind, you could essentially bring that person to you. So it could also attract. Yeah, no, I, I understand what so you're saying. Got, so the object's not haunted as such. No. It's just got the energy impression. Yeah. And that, in its own right, attack, um, brings the, the spirit forward. Mm. In sense. Possibly. I mean, we don't know. We don't know yet. It's just no. it's a preliminary experiment, experiment that you can do. You know, it's an interesting experiment that's quite simple that you can mm. do without it having to be a haunted doll or something. I mean, there are yeah. famous, famous objects around the world. I mean, Annabelle being, you know, the, the main one, Robert the doll that's another mm -hmm. famous one and they've not just got like the mythology of this case itself but they've actually got you know the whole mythology afterwards once it's in the museum i, I think so is know, it I a think that is sort experiment of quite sexist. Of thing? but is it why is it sexist because it always happens to be dolls you never hear of a haunted action man do you no but robert <laughs> the doll I did, I did is a boy doll not... well it's not really is it a doll it doesn't it's not it's, it's a not doll, gendered isn't it? Girls play with dolls. Boys don't. They play Ooh, with action. Oh, now that's sexist. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to go down that route, Ulrich, <laughs> we so need to let him out, Richard, honestly. Oh, he, you are <laughs> going out this afternoon. He is going Take out. Take the risk. Yeah, he's going to go for a walk <laughs> to get some fresh air and lift this pedantic. I've got fresh air. I've got the window. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it the, looks like a whole day out there. These famous <laughs> cases, you know, of... of these haunted dolls or these haunted objects you know what i mean they're it's a focus at the moment it's a very yeah. fashionista focus on the paranormal but when you look back onto certain experiments that have been done it does it lead you down into an interesting um thought pattern you know what i mean well, when, when you I, do I look think, into you know, experiments obviously you, you've got the energy transference onto the objects and it does somehow elicit activity for some people. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I think uh, there's a lot of teams out there then now that try to recreate it as opposed to investigate it properly. You know, and, and I think that's where the popularity comes because, you know, they, they, people want experiences. Mm. So they go out, they do this experiment because they know it works and they just keep recreating it. They don't actually investigate it. Well, yeah, this is sort of something we've touched upon before, sort of like mm. investigating, you know, there's a very sort of grey area now within the paranormal, whether people go for the experience, which there's nothing wrong with that or to investigate. But I do have a sort of a bit of a sort of thing about, uh, you know, if you invest and um, to investigate is a lot more broader sort of term. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, experience. I, I think, you know, th this is what bugs me about the paranormal, to be fair. I mean, someone... Again, as you said, there's nothing wrong with it at all. But if they want just to want the experience, then call themselves ghost hunters. Well, they yeah, they should. That. But Call then there's contro such. controversy over the interpretation of hunter as well. So it's it's only a word to describe. Yeah, I mean, going they're hunting out. out the experience. That that's what they're doing. And I'm, but there are people out there that do essentially just go for the thrill and the experience. Yeah, and they call themselves investigators, and it's like, yeah, but you're not investigating anything. Well, yeah. there we go. That's a whole different topic. I, think. <laughs> yeah, I do think we'll do, that's yeah, a whole different whole topic. That's something. a whole different show. But going back to haunted objects, it is a very interesting when you actually look at it. Um, I think you could look at it from several angles. I think you mm. could look at it as um, being aware that who knows the information about the object being in the room could be telepathic. Yeah, uh, transference. It could be energy that the, somehow the object manages to, you know, have around it that possibly may call a spirit to it because you're tuning into that energy signature. Mm -hmm. Who knows? It could be that all you're doing is reading the energy. It doesn't attract a spirit at all, but you're reading the history, as in picking up the history spiritually, mm. you know, like, me, you know, mediumistically wise type thing. You know, um, it could be that. It could be... 
oh god you know i mean it's just endless it when you look anything. at it i like to i not like, uh, i would even go as far as to say you know you get mediums when they sort of read people you get something that's cold reading i believe with objects they're very visual and a lot of people will sort of come to conclusions and assumptions just by looking at the object and particularly if it's a doll and they uh, you know and more than likely you are going to sort of say you're going to pick up you know a child playing with the doll or something to me because you've got the prompt there i understand what you're saying on that you can make assumptions on the object from the disc, you know yeah. the, from the the thing you know, but the type of person is... that may have owned it and stuff you know, but they, the, you know. The, you're you're discounting the fact if you walk into a room of allegedly go to a museum and they've all got some form of history yeah there's only mm-hmm. a certain amount of assumptions you can make on that and you may only be drawn to one or two items what is yeah. it that's drawing you to that item yeah, to then I, read on. I get that. Not the yeah. fact that you may necessarily know all about the history of, I don't know, uh, oh, the clown doll in the corner. You might not know any history on it. Um, it might just be the one thing in the room that you're drawn to and everyone goes, oh, it's really strange because nobody else gets drawn to that. They all get drawn to the rocking chair. Who knows? Do you know what I mean? That's the interesting part for me. It's like what bits, why you get drawn to it and then what you get through it. Yeah. If you don't must... know it and they don't know it, then... You, you you can't sit there and say you're wrong. You know yeah, what I mean? I, I must admit, I did actually do an experiment in front of a very famous uh, haunted doll here in the UK, and uh, it was a basic dowsing experiment, and the information I came up with was not conducive uh, with a doll. Uh, uh, it was a male I actually came up with, and when I actually spoke to the owners of the uh, doll, they were actually quite sort of surprised because they have had sort of several people come back to them with that mm. sort of it, um, an information. So, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. I, I think, you know, you you might get sort of attracted <laughs> to the doll via the vibrations. If if you work on a spiritual level anyway, you, you vibrate at a certain level. So maybe it's a case of that energy is on the same level. So mm. that draws you to that object. Mm. Oh, or no. it works in, in your specific range of um, vibration. Yeah, mm. it is it's fascinating um, when you actually look at... As I say, it's very controversial. And very People can be very critical of it. You know, mm. I mean, I personally wouldn't trust a haunted doll bought on eBay, personally. But that doesn't mean to say people haven't had experiences with that object and they just want to get rid of it. But it does yeah. seem very fashionista at the moment. And so I'd say buyer beware. Yeah, true say. diligence, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, true Buy diligence. Everywhere. Yeah, and just, you know, let's say there are museums and stuff around that you can go and, and experiment. This. And you can do this with stuff in your own home. You know, I've got some rocks that people have gifted me. I could sit there and play with those and see what i got. And yeah. But rocks are a bit difficult because it's finding where they came from originally. It's like, at least with an object, you've got half a battle won because you yeah. can possibly trace it. But anyway... Moving on, because we're running out of time, believe it or not, lads. Oh, and no. I've, we've got to cover this one, because this one, again, hugely controversial in the paranormal field. And um, it's a lot of it's down to belief system, which is demonic hauntings. Oh, you've got to love demonic Ooh. haunting, haven't you? Now, this has been made very, uh, should we say, popular by TV, I would say. It's hashtag, I'm, it's a demon. Um, yeah. And then he said, I'm a demon then. Hashtag it's a demon is spouted <laughs> quite a lot in the paranormal field in a, a mock of certain television shows that are out there. Um, mm-hmm. But it doesn't change the fact that there is a whole mythology and folklore regarding demons themselves. The origin of the word is actually Greek. Demon doesn't actually mean nasty, evil, Satan loving entity. It's actually mm. just a, a general term for any form of supernatural deity yeah we'll go with that but in this day and age that meaning has transferred into um a bad nasty malevolent non-human um elemental kind of entity that wreaks havoc attaches to you sucks all your energy (laughs) makes you ill and is generally nasty quite frankly yes um yeah do we go with yeah i'll go with that yeah 
I think of all the sort of like hauntings and stuff, the demonic uh, sort of phenomenon we are actually experiencing at the moment. I believe this is sort of a classic example of it being driven by popular culture. So I, I, th I think that demons um, at face value are, are just a religious icon that help you know help the church convince people to go to church the same as angels and demons it's like the opposite mm -hmm. sides of the yeah. coin isn't mm -hmm. it like god and satan like black and white yeah. you know what i mean, I mean you know they, these days a lot of people get like nasty malicious spirits in their home and they just go oh yeah it's a demon well yeah. it could just be um a, a spirit that was very easy to annoy in life you know or not it could be somebody that you've done something in the home they just don't like because it's their home yeah exactly you know so they're yeah. they're showing their unhappiness with that and all of a sudden they're a demon well that's going to yeah. annoy them even more quite frankly well i mean yeah you, you that that film we mentioned earlier the others um mm -hmm. you know that that's a prime example because neither side were were bad or evil it was just the fact that when they shut the curtains I oh, know they didn't they open keep opening the curtains, and yeah. it was interfering with the young boy that lived there because he had a skin condition, and it annoyed the mother, and she kept shutting the curtains again, mm. and um, it turned out that they were the spirits anyway, and it's like, you know that that these people were just annoying the spirits just by opening the mm. curtains, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean. So from their aspect, I suppose they could have just turned around and said, well, yeah, okay, they're, they're angry spirits, they must be demons, and they're not. I'm often wondering, the, the more sort of plausible cases that out there that have been put down to demonic sort of uh, possession and stuff like that, whether this is a very advanced sort of state of uh, poltergeist activity. Hmm. Yeah, with a little bit extra yeah, I good do. measure. I, see, I have to say, my belief system on this is that other forms of energy entity do exist. Mm -hmm. Believe that. I personally believe that's my personal yeah. belief system. I do believe that it's not just humans. You know what I mean? There are other energy entities that exist. Mm -hmm. What they are, where they come from, I don't know. I've looked into lots of different mythology about this and um, I do have that belief system. It goes across culture. Um, you've only got to look yeah. at the gin, you know what I mean, and, and the entities like mm -hmm. that that people talk about. And it goes that every culture has their own form of entity, energy form entity, mm. we'll call them. I yeah. think in the West, we've labelled them demon purely and simply because of, um, like you say, modern culture and through yeah. religious yeah. culture as well. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. When you look at certain possessions, which are all put down to demons, I think that you have to be very, very careful in regards mm. to that because a lot of psychological illnesses will manifest well, in, yes. in this kind of way, depending on the environmental influences that that person has, has been through. I think you have to be very careful of that. But having been through a very strange experience myself... And that's all I can say. It was a strange experience, incredibly coincidental, the way things happened. Belief system, maybe there is no such thing as coincidences. When you look at the chain of events of that, it seems incredibly weird if it wasn't some form of entity attachment. Mm. But I'm very biased because I'm looking at that personally and it was my experience. It's very difficult to call. And it's very difficult yeah. to diagnose mental yes. illness, certain mental illnesses. There, there's a lot of them. You'd have to um, be a, a really knowledgeable psychologist um, for some of them because they're quite rare. Um, so yeah. before you go straight into the demonic haunting or demonic possession, you would have to really, really be careful. Having said that, I do have a belief system that there are elementals and stuff. And I've, you know, doing the work that I do. Um, I am kind of inviting them um, in with some of the, the work we do, you know, trying mm. to connect to these Well, that's it. I mean, for, for, me, an, for me, an elemental isn't a dark, evil spirit. No, at it all. isn't. No, not at all. It, it's just a spirit that exists or an energy that exists, and it's neither good or bad. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you 
if you're the type of person to be quite negative and you keep putting negativity out there, then it almost feeds off of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it could be just having an impact on that particular energy in the spirit that you get negativity back. Manage your expectations. Where- Exactly. Where if you're a positive person, you put positive stuff out. <laughs> mm. It's it tends to again feed off of that, but sort of leaves you alone, does its own thing, and well, I think know, you know, sort, sort of pleasant. Since I've been introduced to like elementals and stuff, it's something I uh, I do actually sort of like believe in now, and uh, you know, and their sort of like behavioural traits is because they will appear as you want them to appear, yeah, or believe they will appear, and uh, this could possibly be tied into your psychological state as well when mm. you sort of like sort of within the presence of these um, elementals, are they taking more from you than just sort of like and 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 how they appear physically to you. Mm. It's very much like um, going down that thought train. It's very much like intention setting. You have to be incredibly mm. honest with yourself about your intentions yeah. for doing any form of energy work, because yeah. your intention is going to be your energy is going to be focusing that intention. And if you're if you've got one bit of bad or horrible intention behind it, or self you know self gratification in there, you've yeah. got to be very very careful. I mean, we say quite often in the spiritual field you know um careful what you ask for because you you're probably going to get it and if it it will manifest in a way that you may not expect it to and a lot of that has come from your your very deep intention so everyone goes oh yeah just you know think what you want and it'll happen but you've got (laughs) it's a lot more work than that the people i think you know um it's one of my little bugbears in the um, the new age pagany world. It's very airy fairy and, and unicorns and and glitter. It's a lot yeah. deeper than that. It's it's very a lot of being self aware and knowing yourself. And when we say know yourself, it's deeply knowing yourself. You know, it's a lot of inner work that people don't realise that they have to do. And uh, you know, it's. One of those easy things to say, but not so easy to do. And people, a lot of people are after the quick click fix, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll just say yeah. it, it'll happen, manifest. Yeah. I'll do my vision mm. board and it'll happen because that's how it works. And that's not mm. how it works, people. You know, it's a lot Feathers of... will turn up on your doorstep and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, but it's very I'm... fluffy. But it's a very fluffy what I know now or sort of have learned, you know, spiritually and sort of like in occult work, it's preparation. I yeah. mean, that is probably 90 percent of the work isn't it you know and this is where you get you know sort of like to do a ritual or to do a sort of like a working or stuff i mean it's 90 percent and preparation for it yeah and I, everyone goes oh i've got my salt circle i'll be safe okay well maybe do a salt circle that you want to get the entity into so you've got control over it yeah if you're going to mm. conjure if you're going into that level of work, then that's what you need to be doing. And people go, oh, but I've got my salt cycle, I'm fine. Oh, oh. It's not, <laughs> that's not salt, as easy as it is. Does the salt circle actually work? Yeah. Why? How? Because, first of all, you've got the element itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but then also... I know, I know it's your, a natural element. So, we talk yeah. about preparation. Yeah, so part of that preparation is creating a space that you believe is safe. Okay, so again, it's more mind, mind controlled. No, there are other reasons you would use salt for its for its um, own elemental purposes. Look, look into well, elemental it is purposes. A crystal, isn't it? Exactly. Case of, because you believe it works, it works. Well, it, it is a crystal in its own right, salt, yeah. and uh, you know whatever sort of properties they are believed to hold. Yeah. One thing's for sure. Whatever your belief system is going into some form of working, whether or not there's a physical reason why it works or whether or not it's a mental reason why it works, which is where Paul's going, it's just your belief system, don't worry about it. Do you know what I mean? Whatever way it is, it's about the preparation of mindset. Whenever you go into a, and this is deep occult working, whenever you go into that, you have to go into it very with this very specific mm. preparation to set your mindset into that because what you're dealing with is energy and forces that you are trying to conjure, yeah? Mm. yeah. From that, you don't know what you're going to get. 
you can you can try and conjure something. Something not you know, a lot of times nothing happens. But a lot of times it does happen too. So if you're yeah. prepared in every aspect of that working, if you're prepared for whatever it is you're gonna get, yeah. I'm going through a process yeah. of, of work at the moment and it's very intense. And takes a lot of concentration. And that's not something you gain by just going, well, I'm going to do this working today. I'll just sit down and do it. It's a preparation. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a build-up to the, the oh, main would, article. Would. It's going to take me months, possibly even a year or two, to get to the end yeah. of this. Because yeah. it's mean, not it, it a five-minute gen- fix. It is generally an interest of, for, for me why the salt would work. Um, it's the same thing with the glass. Because I, I think going back to like the haunted doll, you had like um, uh, wasn't it a glass jar over Annabelle? The yeah, doll? she's in a glass cabinet, what, isn't she? What is it in that glass that makes that spirit confined to inside the glass? I, I can't answer that. Yeah. Exactly, and it doesn't change the composition of the table either. So if it, if there is something in the glass that the spirit can't get, makes the spirit not be able to escape. Why doesn't it just drop down and go underneath the table. Well, particularly when you think about, you know, we talk about ghosts passing through walls and stuff, you know, you yeah. think that they're not encompassed by um, material things on earth. But like I say, I can't answer that question for you. I don't yeah, know, I don't I, I, know the answer. I'm not, I'm not obviously, <clears throat> I'm not taking a mick or anything like that. Or anything like that. No, it's just no, a, it's, it's, it's no. a genuine it's, inquiry. It's just wondering why, why it works. Yeah, yeah, for me, yeah. it's all part of... When I do a ritual or something like that in regards to the salt circle and stuff like that, it's about prep. It's about yeah. it's about mindset preparation and putting myself into your sacred space, I suppose some people would class it as. You know, some people have altars, you know, like uh, the Wiccan community, you know, they'll have an altar and that is their sacred space. You don't have to mm. have a whole room, even just an altar area. Mm. When you step into that space... That is becomes your altar area. You know that's your sacred area where you're doing yeah. your working. Assess, stepping into that steps into yeah. that mindset of this is where I'm going to do my work. This is what I'm going to to um, do with energy today. This is my my mm-hmm. my worship too. Because you know you don't just do um, you know part of it isn't just about conjuring and doing spell works. It, it's a lot of worship as well. You know like to the nature and. You know, various yeah. times of the year, like Beltane and, and Stara and stuff like that. You know, you're you're actually sitting, um, you're setting a form of worship and and ritual around a festival um, to thank the elementals, the spirits, the sprites, the imps, the fairies, the this, the that. Do you know what I mean? Whatever it is that your belief system holds, so it is part of that. But I do think, in regards to demons, going back to demons, that mm-hmm. they. You know, even when you look at Phalor, they appear as you expect them to appear. Yeah. Demons and... appear as you expect them to appear. Going back to the true word of demon, not bad Satan demon, we're talking about an entity demon. So if you're expecting bad, crappy, horrible, mis- disfigured, burning eyes kind of entity, chances are that's what you're going to get. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and you shouldn't be surprised when you get it. Yeah, and also if you are in the belief system that it is a human spirit that you're encountering at an investigation, or you know, in your whatever it is that you're out there doing, there are bad people. Yeah, there are I'm good sorry. people. Don't if they if they're doing something that may be like you know you said at the top of the show, you know if they're doing something that feels bad like slamming a door, it could be that they're really annoyed because you stepped into their area and they're like, who the hell are all these people? Yeah. Or if you're being abusive, I mean, some teams go in there and are very provocative in their language. You know, they don't treat them like that you would another human being. I would not walk mm. into a pub full of people and go, wait, who's going to talk to me then? If you've got the balls, come and talk to me. You wouldn't <laughs> do that in life. Why on earth would you do that on a paranormal investigation? I'm, I'm going to do that now. Because, and then the and a door slams. Oh, this is a problem. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I see. You're big enough to slam a door, but you're not big enough to talk to me. Why would I want to talk to you if you're talking to me like that? It depends on, yeah. you know, you've got to be aware of all this. You know, and actually, Absolutely. if it is actually a real true life kicking and screaming demon from hell, 
would you want to talk to a demon from hell like that? You'd be like, I'm backing away <laughs> from the big scary demon. You know what I mean? So people give it a lot of bravado um, when encountering, mm. and I'm going to use the, the term spirit in regards to entity, you yeah. know, um, without actually, first of all, being self-aware and knowing their intentions and what they're doing there. You know, it's, it's a lot more work than the people um, are prepared to necessarily put in. It's all a jolly. Going out on a paranormal investigation with your mates, going to go, we're going to get some activity, we're going to record it, we're going to put it on YouTube, and that's the end of it. It's not, you have to be very careful, you're playing with energy. Sorry, yeah. I went on a little yeah. soapbox moment there, no, didn't I? Right, <laughs> we're Good taking that Bill. soapbox away from you. <laughs> have, have we got enough time to um, go through this next box? We've got about a minute. <laughs> okay. put, put that box away. Well, I'll put your soap box away and I'll leave that box in the shadows for the next show. Well, very much so, because there are other forms of haunting that we just haven't been able to cover. And there's crisis ghosts and there's, um, you know, the shadow the man, shadows, shadow creatures, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. There's lots of other things, but I think we've demonstrated that throughout this little um, types of haunting show that you can't always put them in a box. They cross over quite mm. a lot and you actually have to look deeper and not just take things on face value and know yourself when you're investigating as well. What are you expecting to see and what aren't you expecting to see? And sometimes it could be that you see yeah, what you're expecting. True. And on that note, my beautiful boys, I'm, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I took up the time with <laughs> well my done, soapbox girl. moment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. It, it gonna... killed a few minutes, didn't it? <laughs> Anyway, next week, join us. We have got the lovely John Fraser, who has written a book all about poltergeist. We're actually going to focus a bit more on that next week. On that note, thank you for joining us. We're exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. So say goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. guys.